Thank you, everyone. I've uh, I've been chit chatting here uh, as we were joining, so I apologize if I uh, took up anybody's extra time. So, John, I'm going to try to just share a. I don't want a Chrome tab. I want the actual Chrome program. So hopefully this works. Let me know if I can. Everyone can see the screen coming through. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. So what I'm going to do just as a uh, uh, word of caution, and if I fumble on my keyboard, um, I'm going to be going switching back and forth between tabs. So let me let me try that real quick. There we go. Um, this is chapter four or the uh, workflow basics um, in this particular chapter, uh, we covered uh, a lot of details surrounding the environment itself or the UI, the actual RStudio UI. Um, so John has put together our learning objectives uh, for this particular section. Uh, we're going to plan on understanding the RStudio interface, and that's going to be that uh, UI user interface. Uh, we also have the command line. Um, <laughs> it says use the R command line boldly. Um, Yes, we're going to we're going to learn how the uh, console and the and the script and the command line works uh, hand in hand. It's it's a really awesome uh, point. Um, following uh, good style conventions when writing code. Uh, so I've got a couple of examples of that, uh, as well as in uh, John's uh, uh, book down. We also have some examples there as well. And then uh, confidently call functions in R, and that's going to be one of the 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 strongest points in in realizing how. John made a comment about dplyr uh, next week, and that'll be a, a fun point to really start getting into function calls. So, all right. Uh, one thing uh, before we, you before you go sorry, John. further, can you just uh, like zoom in a level or two? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, let me let me see if I can get that to work. Uh, let's try um, between Windows and Mac. <laughs> there's a trick right. of which one it is. Let's try it this way. Yeah. Does that make it easier, sir? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks. Much better text. Okay, excellent. So what we're going to start off with, team, is the is the UI itself, the user interface. Now, the user interface in our studio is a four console pane of information. So the first one is our console pane. That's going to always be by default on the lower left. It can be changed. You can mix and match these panes all over. You can collapse them so they're not visible if you if you so choose. Um, it's really up to the user on uh, the look and the feel of of your of your computer screen and and what makes you most apt for uh, for uh, uh, ease of use. So the console uh, by default lower left corner. If I go to the next point, we have our script pane. Now the script pane is where you're going to write your scripts. These are going to be uh, textual documents that you'll call upon. I'll show you that uh, in a moment. Think of this as like your saved space, and it is a tabbed. Form. So depending on how many documents you have open, uh, uh, it will increase in the amount of tabs you have. Okay. The next environment is the environment pane. Uh, the environment pane is calling on your uh, memory, uh, cached memory, uh, stored memory, etc. Uh, it also has some additional features that we can turn on or turn off depending on how uh, in, in integrated into our studio uh, you have these additional features. In a couple of talks uh, or a couple of meetings uh, a while back, uh, we got into a topic of, of using Git, G-I-T, Git, um, as a service. So if you have Git plugged in, this will show up in your in your environmental pane. Okay. As the final pane that we have is going to be the help menu, uh, that is going to be the other pane. Uh, other meaning that it kind of collects all of your other resources, your file browser, uh, your uh, help menu, et cetera. So uh, John, I'm gonna switch over to show that particular screen and we'll talk about these four elements briefly. So uh, team, what I've done is, is again, John, I've zoomed in, so this is gonna get really big. If we need to zoom down, I can. But uh, our, our script pane is going to be that top right, uh, top left corner. Um, our scripts are going to be placed in here and you can run that code. Uh, for the most part, if you're just interacting with the environment, uh, you will use the console uh, pane. Um, I want to add on just a brief moment here. Uh, in that console pane, you also have some additional tabs. Those include the terminal or any running jobs. So if you're uh, running code, John had made a comment last week. Uh, he was running a script that was uh, going for four or five days long. Uh, he could probably go to the jobs tab and see how uh, complete that is. Uh, depending on the environment that you're working on, if it's Windows, Linux, or Mac, 
uh, you can drop into terminal. Uh, in this example, uh, I'm running a uh, RStudio server. So um, this is on a Linux machine uh, that I'm, I'm connected to. Um, I can actually interpret uh, commands directly in here if I needed to work within the uh, operating system itself. So that's a, a really neat uh, feature that you can switch back and forth there. Okay. Up at the top in our environmental tab or environmental uh, uh, window pane, top right corner, uh, you have your environment. We're gonna start to see this populate as we run our code. Uh, these are uh, like stored memory. I made the comment of cached memory. Uh, usually it's not persistent or if you close and, and, and open back up, you may get a note that says, do you wanna save your R environment? Well, that's R saving it so that it can and pull it back up the next time. Um, if you have to restart R, it'll it'll go back and, and select those as well. Uh, the history tab uh, is another one. Um, I was running some code here. I cleaned this out multiple times, but um, the history tab is going to be a, a, an object where you can view the past running console commands that you've entered, um, any connections that you may have, uh, connections meaning databases or uh, uh, other environments, other services, servers that you may have. Uh, the build environment, I've, nev I've never really used this too much. Um, John, do you want to expand on the build environment or anybody else? No? Okay. Uh, Sorry, I was I muted. Um, That's okay. I, I Go ahead, just sir. really briefly, I it's like a whole separate um, set of clubs. But within our, with this book, the way it's set up, okay. um, the build environment interacts with it and you'll have some options there. So it, you know, like it says, build a book, that'll like produce the book, um, any oh, updates. Okay. Um, or okay. if you're working with creating packages, that's the other thing where you use ah. the build environment or the build tab. I've, I've seen a couple of those videos. We have the, the book of uh, packages that uh, you can compile with. Um, my personal favorite in this environmental window is the Git tab. So if you're saving any new files, if you're committing new changes to GitHub, GitLab, or any version control that you're using, um, this will show up and you can commit those changes. Uh, that's a really good, awesome uh, tool to use. Uh, again, a, a completely different subject in its own right. Okay. Finally, the uh, other, other window uh, or this other box at the bottom uh, right corner of your screen uh, by default is going to be your files and you can select your current working environment that you're you're uh, actively pursuing. Um, if you have any ggplot outputs uh, that'll populate in your plots window. Um, as an example, this book down uh, document that we're, we're viewing right now, um, if we were to compile it, it would show up in this window and then you can pop that out into a browser if you if you so choose. Uh, you can see any loaded packages in your RStudio environment. Uh, this is a really helpful point to see the versions. Uh, there's other ways that you can also uh, compile this or, or view it uh, in the console window as well. Uh, last week uh, during our presentation, um, we were going back in and out of the uh, help function. And by uh, I'll show you an example here in a moment. But um, if you select a question mark and then some uh, function or some argument, it'll pop over to the help menu. And again, it'll be in this uh, particular viewer. And then the last is the viewer tab. Uh, and that's gonna be, again, where that book down uh, menu uh, were to compile and, and, and view. Uh, I've already moved that off into a different tab, so it's empty at the moment. Any questions on the UI or any comments on, on some of the functions inside here? I am scratching the surface on the, the, the power and awesomeness of, of the UI. There's so many different ways and, and, and uh, shortcuts that you can access to, uh, to utilize a lot of the environment as a whole. Okay, I'll go back I would, to our previous tip. I just say Richard? that one, one thing on this that um, the book doesn't cover and our slides don't cover is the latest versions of our studio allow you to customize this quite a lot. I don't know if Ryan's going to talk about that at all. Yeah, let me Yeah, let me jump into that yeah. topic real quick. That's a great <laughs> statement. So um, I discovered this uh, briefly. I started to close tabs or close my windows and then realized, oh, I need to open those back up. What I found, if you go to the view uh, option and then scroll down and it is panes. So if you select your pane layout, um, what this allows is to uh, 
add or subtract things that uh, uh, may be uh, an option for you. Uh, is this where you are going with the, the topic, John, the comment? Uh, somewhat, but I think you are okay. back. Um, you are not on the latest version and you can have, okay. you can add columns now. And so you can do like completely change the layout to however you want it to be basically. Interesting. Um, I haven't okay. done that, but just so that you're not confused if you, you know, presumably if you're just starting, you probably have a very new version of our studio and it'll look slightly different. They've made it even more customizable. I guess a key part of that is you don't have to. Like it's something that later in life as you're working with it, if you're like, oh, I really yeah. need to have, like sometimes I like to have two different um, source panes open next to each other. Mm -hmm. So if you have two different scripts open next to each other and you can do that now in the new version of our studio. Do you find that's like resource heavy, uh, like like real estate, I shouldn't say resource, I, uh, real estate heavy? I haven't actually out. used the R Studio version because I'm too used to just popping out a window because you can pop Good out point. one of the source code things and that's what it's always been. I, I don't I don't have it internalized yet of, oh wait, no, I can just do it within R Studio. So Good point. I don't know yet if it causes any problems. It, it shouldn't because it's just a text editor when it's a separate okay. window, but I don't know. Well, and if, if you don't mind, I'll expand on that subject just briefly. So uh, other other programs, other services that you can utilize, uh, Sandra had mentioned Anaconda as a, as a possibility, and there's a whole other ecosystem that we can discuss in that environment too. Um, real estate in the worlds of data science or statistics, real estate becomes an issue on your screens. I'm talking about the, the, the actual panes of your screen. As of Windows 10, uh, Linux and Mac have always been able to do this, but as of Windows 10, you can now start to create extra desktop environments. And so uh, you can in, uh, evoke uh, even more real estate. You're, you, you may have one screen, two screens, three screens, uh, but now you can start to create additional environments where you can expand into those as well. There's other options to, uh, to navigate with. Uh, as a workflow for myself, John, to complement your statement, um, I create a lot of different tabs or screens on, on pages. So I'll break things out. So it's just keyboard shortcuts going back and finding information coming back in and out of all these different screens. So um, I don't know if anybody's more relevant to Windows, uh, relevant to, to Mac or, or if they've uh, bridged into the Linux world or not, but um, these are always been available and a lot of users don't even realize they, they exist until they're, it's kind of a discovery. Oh, wow, I didn't know I could do that. Um, that was a, uh, an awesome point there. All right, I'll go ahead and close this out. Uh, John, maybe for, for if, if I get the opportunity for another presentation, I'll try to update our studio and, and see if I can expand into those extra arenas. That's actually cool. I'd like to try that. Sure. Going into the next topic. So that was the user interface. Now we're gonna talk about the console. So the console specifically is that bottom left corner. And think of that as is not so much a, well, it's, a, it's an interpreter. You're, you're typing commands into the console and then you're getting a reply back. Uh, as a, an initial uh, investment into our studio, it's a good idea to get familiar with using the console or exercising some of the commands that you can use within it. Um, this first example that John has in our book down is uh, our presentation. If you just put a thingy, uh, uh, I like the word that they, they called it thing. Um, if you just put a thing into the console, it'll reply back and say, uh, uh, re reply back. Uh, a lot of users will create the hello world. So let's do that real quick. And in the console, I, I'm just gonna put the number four, uh, just the same example as before. What we see is that it replied back and said, okay, you gave me number four, I'm giving you back number four. Uh, good way of playing ping pong with the computer. Uh, as the next slide will indicate, you can also use the console as a calculator uh, if you're uh, really frantic and trying to find one. Um, for me, my Windows environment that I have for work, for whatever reason, the calculator doesn't work. So I use Python and R quite often if I have to do, crunch some numbers. So let's just do two plus two, okay? And it'll reply back the number four. If I wanna do the, the uh, uh, the number three cubed, right? So three to the power of three. So that will reply with 27. Three times three times three is 27. So it is a good way to 
uh, use it as just a mathematical interpreter. Uh, you can type in some uh, very basic uh, commands and it'll, it'll give you the answer back. Uh, as an extension, I don't wanna go too far from our presentation. Uh, the next topic is there are some predefined, very uh, predefined uh, mathematical calculations inside R that you can you can pull from. As an example, is the the value pi, uh, twenty two divided by seven. Uh, the other is you could get the list of letters in the uh, English alphabet. So let's do that real quick. Uh, we can type in pi pi, and we can see that it's three point one four one five nine three repeating until infinity. If I want the, the, the letters A through Z, I just type in the word letters. No, nope, sorry, is it letters? Letters. There it is. So what we have on our console screen replying back to us is the letters A through Z. Uh, John makes a comment in our, excuse me, I knew I was gonna do that, there we go. Uh, made a comment that, uh, or in the book, uh, it makes a reference to the fact that uh, you can call on this in your coding, especially if you want to name variables quickly. Uh, you can maybe make a table of letters and then populate, you know, variables based on that. Um, just a, a more advanced comment, but the, the numbers and letters, sequential values, uh, you can start to assign uh, arguments to those. Uh, so just a, a, a side note of, of some of the value that the, the uh, auto-interpreted input to our console provide you. Okay. The next is going to be uh, if you're working within a particular data frame or, or, or calling on that data frame. As an example, uh, we want to print out a, a standard or a, a print out some information. Uh, in this case, uh, we have the gg2plot diamonds uh, data frame. So you can just call out ggplot2 as a package and then the, uh, the data frame inside diamonds, and then have that display on the screen. I don't know if that'll work in my current environment. Let me try that. Diamonds, ggplot2, ggplot2, diamonds. Spell it correctly. And again, I'm gonna move this up just slightly so you can get a larger view of what's going on. Okay. By in uh, interacting with your data frame or interacting with your information. If it's a CSV file, JSON file, whatever you're ingesting into R um, as this uh, 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 content, uh, by calling on it and then uh, expressly telling it, just show me on the screen what I'm working with. Right? This is a, an easy way to uh, get some information about our, our, our data that we're processing. Okay. We can see that it only prints out the first 10 lines of text, um, there's a total of 53,930 uh, uh, rows of information within the diamonds data frame. So um, it is efficient. It's only showing you the first front matter. Uh, in most cases, the, uh, the top row or your column variable name uh, is what you're gonna be working with. Again. All right, in addition, uh, similar to what we were talking about in Pi and in uh, uh, mathematical arguments, uh, you can also call out evaluations. So if we want to evaluate a, a point, uh, pass it a mathematical value and then say, tell me what the cosine of this value is. Um, so our example here says, what's the cosine of Pi? Well, it's gonna give back the negative one, right? Um, you can also, uh, pass in additional uh, values, uh, uh, mathematical arguments. In this case, uh, the uh, asterisk sign is representing a multiplication. So 60 times 60 is uh, times 24 is going to be 8,000 uh, or 8,600. 8, so let's do that real quick. Forgive me, I keep using the wrong keyboard shortcut. Uh, so if I want the, uh, the uh, cosine of pi, and I'm putting, putting that in parentheses, okay, I get the option of negative one. If I do the sine of pi, um, the extra e minus 16 is a very small decimal point, uh, but the uh, uh, e is exponent. So it's passing me a, neg a negative 16. So I'd have to move my decimal point back 16 values. 
continuing on. Next, we're going to talk about the assignment names. Now, in our, uh, we want to assign variables or, or actually name uh, uh, variables, uh, something very specific to both the script and to the person uh, authoring and reading or interpreting uh, the value. And to do that, we're going to use the assignment operator. Uh, that is a uh, uh, less than symbol and then the hyphen. Um, it's the specific code. In the textbook, if, if you did read the actual textbook, uh, they make a reference to other uh, uh, scripting languages may use a equals or double equals uh, to assign variables. Uh, we don't want to do that in R uh, because it is a statistical language. The equal symbol does mean something uh, or, or, or has a particular purpose within the script. Uh, so we use the uh, assignment variable instead. Uh, again, that's the, the second paragraph. Go ahead, John. Yeah, just I resisted the arrow for a long time because I learned other I programming languages before R and it just seemed weird. But now, number one, learning alt minus helps a lot that if you type alt minus, it inserts that entire arrow with spaces around it. Correct. Yeah. Um, but it, it actually, it I find it to be really helpful when I'm looking through code and trying to find like, you know, searching control F through code. If you're trying to find where tau is defined, it's you mm -hmm. can search for the tau arrow versus if you say tau equals, that means it's some argument named tau or it's some, you know, it's, it, oh, it makes it different. So it makes it mean a different thing in my code. And so by consistently using it, I find it really helpful. Like, cause a lot of times you do want to know, you know, where's this function defined or right. that kind of thing. Um, so I, it, it was, I mean, it's weird. It, the reason it's an arrow is S where that R came from was written on keyboards that had an arrow key. And so when they created the language, it wasn't weird to type an arrow. You just hit the key that had an arrow on it. I see. Um, and that makes it weird. It's definitely, it's a weird construct. I don't know of any other language that doesn't use or that has something other right. than equals. Um, but I actually find it really helpful in making code more readable. Well, it, and does that, say, that, does that statement also imply like in uh, uh, email addresses or URLs, uh, this particular uh, name at domain.com, uh, uh, right? Uh, rmetcalf at my email address.com is going to immediately uh, notify the server that that's the destination path that the email is going to. The ampersand or the, the at symbol, that was not ampersand, sorry, the at symbol uh, that was chosen uh, to, to specify that, correct? Is that right. similar to the statement of the arrow? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, you know, they had this key, so they used it. And uh, it, it because they did want something that meant something separate from equals. Uh, and then of course, equals equals is what we actually use for equality, but still it, it's correct. a separate thing. It, it calls it out. And so when you're reading the code, you can clearly see where things are being assigned versus where they're just being used um Good if you're point. consistent about it and it's it's well, funny i'm reading another book um practical statistics for data scientists um which has our code in it and they put everything in equals like they use equals for all of their assignment oh no. and it it looks so weird to me now that i'm like what why would you why would you do that <laughs> So that well, that tells me that the person authoring that text or that's that particular chunk of code may not be familiar with the, the scripting language, especially if, if somebody they, else is looking at it. I, I, I mean, there are people who don't follow that convention because you know, equals yeah. does work, it just I, I think it is worth getting used to um, the Good assignment point. arrow as a separate thing. Well, and if but you R don't mind me, oh, sorry. Ahead, sorry, R, R accepts both, so if you see code. Right. Sometimes it's going to be the arrow and sometimes it's going to be the equal. So you just have to remember both of them mean the same thing. Um, so, good point. Yes. In almost every situation. But that's the problem is there are a couple of places where they don't mean the same thing. Um, and so just in general, uh, I don't know. I, I advise getting used to it. But yes, be, be, be ready to accept it when you see it with just an equals that it most of the time just means an uh, arrow. Um, Excellent statement. Yeah. 
I was well. So to 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 the benefit of the class, I I kind of created my own little weird sort of running tally of of uh, doing these steps, uh, trying to showcase exactly what they are. Uh, I am going to use the the script window, but we'll see the uh, output of that script down below. So, for example, uh, when we were talking about just typing in a thing and then having it respond back. Uh, to do this quickly, if you hit your control enter key uh, or in, on Mac command enter key, uh, that executes a line of text or a line of code. So I ran the first uh, point, which you can see this, uh, you can just type something in and the console will reply. And then I'll do it again. Um, and we see the numbers four and five being printed. Now I turned on the feature that it highlights exactly where your cursor is. Uh, this is a visual cue of, of more if you don't have that turned on, it's just the cursor blinking at you. So it makes it a little bit harder to, to visualize where exactly is my execution line uh, at by highlighting the text and then uh, uh, also seeing the blinking cursor. Uh, that means that we know exactly what's going to be executed next. So in the subject of uh, a variable assignment to a, a particular name or a value, I should say that, a value assigned to a name. Uh, in the textbook or John, maybe in, in the book down, it uses the word get. So it's saying this value, this variable name gets the particular value. So that's how you would want to read that uh, arrow. So I'm creating a variable name, some name, and I'm passing it the numeric uh, entry value of one. So I hit control enter, and we can see that now I've passed that. So then I call that name again, and it passes back the number one. Okay. Now, on the left-hand side, let's start using the other windows here. Because I've created this variable name, it is in cached space or it is part of the environment. I now have a value called some name, and it's the number one. Okay. Well, if I want to reassign that just really quickly, quickly, I can say some name. Sorry, not there. Control Z. No. Come on now. Um, if I wanted to name that uh, or get, pass it a different variable, I would have to give it a new value. Enter two. All right. And so you, then if I call call it again. You typoed and said someone instead of some name. Oh, so. shoot. Okay. <laughs> I create. Sorry. Thank you for catching that. Yeah. yeah good, good catch. Um, I was attempting to update the value of some. <laughs> some name to uh, the, the number uh, two, but uh, I guess, yes, John admitted, I, I just created a whole new instance by mistake. Um, so the next point in the text in relation to naming conventions, uh, you want to have either numbers or letters, uh, you can use underscores and periods. Uh, I wanted to complement uh, our maybe those users that may be familiar with Python and then coming over to R uh, as a learning num uh, learning con naming convention, uh, syntactic uh, convention. In Python, the underscore is a uh, okay to use. In R, it will give you a, 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 a error. You cannot use the underscore at the beginning of a name. So I'm calling out my name and then putting, uh, obviously my name, Ryan, in there. Uh, and we'll see that this errors out. Uh, I've got this twice. I was trying your uh, shortcut, John, in the book. Uh, it typed it twice. So hit command enter. So I get an unexpected input underscore. It doesn't recognize what that means. And so if I call on it, it won't know. If I remove that and I put the underscore in between the letter my or the, the name my and the name. So that is the variable name, my name. Uh, now it will recognize it and pass that uh, string variable back. I use another convention on this second point where I'm putting the period as a uh, uh, separation point as well. And this kind of gets into a little bit more, uh, I won't say eloquent, it's it's similar to what John was referring to on the, uh, the assignment variable, uh, assignment argument. Um, you want to really kind of stick to a convention as you're typing. Um, if it's, you know, underscores in between names, if it's periods in between names, uh, whatever you use, if you start to mix and match, uh, they make a reference to camel case 
uh, snake case, uh, different ways that you can you can name variables. Uh, just whatever you apply, try to stick to that same convention. So as another person reading your code can start to follow your convention as well. Um, my only statement to this or my only caution would be uh, if you start to copy and paste code snippets off of uh, Stack Overflow uh, or Google or any other uh, uh, Vignet or anything, uh, you want to be careful that the previous author may be using a different convention that will look a little bit weird. Um, only an advanced person would probably notice that happening. If, uh, if, if you're a layman, uh, that probably wouldn't, wouldn't even, you wouldn't even notice it. Uh, but for, uh, for somebody that's uh, uh, very specific on a coding language or a convention, uh, it, it'll drive you nuts. And I would say, um, Periods and names are completely valid, but I would okay. caution against them um, okay. because if you keep going in our, if you eventually are programming with uh, something called S3 in our, the periods have a special meaning, it'll still work, okay. but it makes things confusing um, if you have like functions named with periods. So just getting in the habit of not using them is better. I say that, but you know, For data sure. frame has a period in the name and then the pa popular package data table has a period in the name um so lots of people do it still uh but i it's helpful not to <laughs> i will i will take that up uh that's a that's a good statement i didn't realize that yeah i can see where the confusion would definitely uh be a problem uh in 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 more advanced or future uses of, of the scripting language yeah, and it's one of those things that you don't know that it's confusing until you get to a certain point in using R, and then you're like, oh, oh, wow, okay, everything, every piece of code I've ever written now is confusing to me because what it that part after the period yeah. it means in these other systems, it means like what type of um, variable should this apply to? So you would say dot character dot mm -hmm. integer for different types of variables, and so. Um, like there are functions that are like data dot frame dot data dot frame <laughs> versus data dot frame dot default. Um, and so it's, you know, just having those periods makes it really confusing. Um, and well, so it's good to get in the habit of not using them. And, and if you, if you would allow to expand uh, one of my biggest Metcalf shiny red buttons that I, I always try to, to tell new users about is uh, the uh, use the underscore instead of a space. Um, you don't, so in, in different operating systems, different namespace variables, uh, uh, path uh, variables, uh, the operating system will allow you to put a space, like just say you create a directory and, and you, you name it, you know, my space, uh, you know, with, a, with a, a space in between. In a interpretive environment or, you know, uh, Python R, uh, C++, any other format, you have to actually escape that space because that's a special character. And so it makes your, your code really wrangled. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, if you follow that convention, if you want to put an underscore and replace that as a space, it makes the uh, code much cleaner and easier. Uh, you don't have to get a little bit ninja, uh, intricate, uh, Olympic, uh, gymnastics through your, your, uh, uh, processing to, to get something to come up. So search terms. So, I have a question. Comment, sir. Yes. I've heard you refer to the, the things multiple times as variables. I thought in our, they were called objects because variables in statistics mean something different. Good, good comment. I'm in, in, I know in every other language that I've used, it, that thing is called a variable, but I was under, can, so can I, I will. Can, that's a great comment. I'll uh, I'll do my best to call them objects instead. Uh, you are correct. Uh, that's probably a better uh, likeness to this environment uh, of, of calling that naming convention. Um, forgive me for using the <laughs> word very. I I use that term so often. It's it's it, it can mean multiple things. Yeah, I yeah. was confused too. The first time I used R, I'm like, what is that <laughs> thing called? And they were yeah. I was like, because they don't. If if the variable is the name of the column in the CSV. What is that thing called? And it's like, oh, they just call it an object. Good point. Good point. John, yeah. did you want to expand? Oh, uh, just um, I, I have seen it used somewhat interchangeably. But you're, I mean, you're right that 
variable can have a different name meaning in R, so it is better to call it an object. And I don't yeah. think I follow that convention very well. So thank you. Like that is a good thing to point out. I, I just like uh, there is a function variable dot names that I just uh, pulled up the help for. And here, if you do uh, that, that should pull it up. And even though the that is talking about the names of variables and it's using the word variable to mean ver you know object in the help it like the the name of the thing that you put into the function is an object that like the the argument name is object not variable um and so they they follow that convention um that's interesting i i hadn't thought about that before <laughs> well uh, it's it's an awesome critique, and and, and yeah. moving forward throughout the book club, I'll do my best to try and change that uh, vocabulary and 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 call it its proper uh, name. Yeah. I think in any computer science or any any programming language, uh, the proper lexicon used within the the context is probably a, a good thing to stick with. So, good comment. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed part of that conversation what what thing is the object is it the before it's, the arrow or after the arrow <laughs> uh kind of both but more okay. so the thing before the the arrow okay like the generic name for a thing in r is object and we were calling it a variable oh okay yeah so it's okay. yeah <laughs> like I, again it's it's a nit, a nitpick but it's one of those that at some point in your career depending on how you're working with things it might become confusing so just getting that internalized that it's an object okay seems helpful um that's it's interesting i had never thought about it <laughs> right. but if you look through help pages like an r object appears in help all over the place yeah. and so they use that term object like often and i hadn't even i hadn't thought about it um so that's a good one it matters a lot if you do more statistics stuff because that, yeah that's where it came from right yeah <laughs> did that answer your question becky i think so <laughs> i probably just will take practice <laughs> yeah gotcha no so like I, I have where a, a my quick... name another name those are the um objects yeah and you put yes. the value like sam and ryan are the values oh thank you that helps <laughs> and then you assign the value ryan to the object my name okay yep. so whenever you type my name out you'll get ryan for now but you can always use the object reassign it where you said i don't want it to be ryan anymore i want it to be sam he didn't do oh, it okay. here but that object name you could always put a new value in it which happens when you do more um coding later on you'll do that where you'll put a new value to that object Name. That is an excellent explanation. Thank you. <laughs> it is. Sandy, did I, you want to I say something? A, yes, I do. So then what is meant by a variable in R? Why and do you know? Like what, what call, type, what encompasses a variable? Like what's, what's um, a, yeah. Well, that's, I, mean, I, I, I think, yeah, go ahead. John. Basically, more often it would be the column of a data frame is a ah, variable. Okay. Versus the data frame is an object. And if okay. you refer, if you build that column in the data frame using some, uh, you know, like a, a list of numbers, that list of numbers would be an object and it would become a variable in the data frame. Mm -hmm. So a variable specifically, like it's, it's, a, it's a feature, it's a, a thing that you are studying. And that's why they differentiate between the programming thing as an object, the right. statistical thing is a variable like the or the the thing the thing you're observing is a variable okay, um, okay. which i it's interesting i had never thought of it that way but it's definitely like number one it's it's definitely in help that way i, I was, i've been sitting here kind of poking through some help pages <laughs> like it is in at least base r they use they pretty strictly use that differentiation and it totally like it makes sense like if you talk about a variable in r 
you usually are talking about a variable that you're studying, not a programming thing. Got it. So, well, and oh, yeah. okay, okay, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you for bringing that one up. That that's really interesting to me. Yes, thanks, well, it, it, <laughs> it's, yes, yeah. it, it's it's mind blowing because I, I you you have multiple languages you know that you're you're communicating with and I don't know humans have a tendency that I don't know uh, try to make association to stuff and if, if if you clearly define exactly what it is it, it it starts to make sense but if you muddy the waters I suppose that it, it could be difficult. Yeah, this is so definitely this is definitely something that um, you know if you're reading Stack Over, Overflow responses or whatever people will say variable and mean object for sure, yeah. because I would have done yeah. that. I did do that earlier today. Um, but that's, it's really interesting to know the difference and think about that. And, you know, I'm going to try to be more conscious of that because I, like, I definitely have had conversations where I'm talking about the variables in the, in the data, not variables in my code. And, you know, right. being mm -hmm. able to differentiate those is really helpful. So yeah. kind of strictly yeah. using those words, I think would, will be helpful. Yeah. I guess because so, oh, this is a sorry. number like statistics, right? And yeah. Statistics. Yeah. It's called those. Those things are variables in in programming when you we lay it out or to use R. We, they usually read it like maybe a CSV or something, and then mm -hmm. they turn it into a data frame for programming mm -hmm. wise. But statistics, in statistics, each thing's a variable. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So then, is there a difference between a variable and a feature? Uh, no, I mean, probably like, I think features are more when you okay. like a variable you're going to use for modeling. Um, I'm sure someone somewhere has a strict definition that differentiates them, but to me, in my mind, they're basically the same thing. Okay. Okay. That also <laughs> might be like field specific because yeah. sometimes like, um, like I work a lot with genes, you know, and gene expression. Mm -hmm. So those tend to be called features as opposed to variables yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah. Could, could you define it as characteristics maybe of that uh, variable then? Uh, a feature would be a characteristic of a variable. Uh, that I, I may be splitting hairs and, and getting too, too detailed into the use of the language. but Yes, I, I think you could say that because oftentimes, so the way that we analyze it is you have different samples and then all of the mm -hmm. genes for that sample, right? So your samples come in columns. So I would say yes. those would be variables. And then all of the genes are the rows. So those tend to okay. be called features, but you know, you can always transpose, right? So then one would be well, to, a subset of the other, yeah. To, well, to, to bring in the, the thought process of the tidyverse then, uh, mm -hmm. everything has a place, everything has a purpose, everything has a, a, a row and column separation. Mm -hmm. um, would that, now also uh, similar to the comment of, of the, the, my, my poor use of the word variable, would, uh, <laughs> would that also want to alter the language to expressly detail what that term implies? Um, do you think that the, the word feature and var uh, the word feature and variable uh, maybe get a little bit confusing? I don't know. I, I'm, I think, I'm I think only it might being rhetorical. Because I've also taken, you know, like statistics for using Python. And then um, I think it's slightly different in the usage, but I think, you know, you also know the context of your own field and what is referred to as a feature. And so consistently I see that genes are features. And so, um, you know, within any package that you use for this type of like bioinformatics, that tends to be consistent. And I just noticed just from this conversation that for example, there is a package for analyzing gene expression in single cells, right? And it always calls variables objects. And I was like, well, that makes sense why it's doing that now. So yeah, this is a very, very, very cool discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mind blowing, mind blowing. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to extend just briefly into uh, uh, the current book down uh, uh, view of our document. Uh, I'm implying, John, do you probably use Windows most often? Is that a, a possibility or? Uh, I, I mean, I, I do, I use uh, RStudio server most of the time. Okay. So, um, and actually 
these notes were made by my coworker Jonathan, who uses Mac. Oh, okay. Um, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the it was the alt minus. I guess is the the question. I I realized I, while I was coding, it's it's actually option minus if you're on a Mac. Uh, well, if you're on a Mac keyboard, which you know, because the there you go. the generic word is still alt. Which I don't know. I I just just an aside. I find it amusing that you're pro open source but also pro Mac which is like the it's most weird, closed yeah. ecosystem is. there is. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, moving on. <laughs> good, good statement. Um, those, uh, those users, if you have different uh, uh, operating systems, the, uh, the, the, op the calls that they may have in the text or in the, in the book down uh, may be slightly altered in, in, in actual uh, expression or how you how you apply it in uh, uh, in the uh, interpreter or in the console. So um, the next comment we were making is going to be uh, in printing. So if uh, we want to put so so oftentimes when you assign the object the uh, variable itself the value itself, then uh, you may want to call uh, call it a, a back a second time. If you put it in parentheses all as one uh, point, um, it will assign it and then also print it back to the screen. Uh, so it's kind of a, a shortcut way of uh, being able to view exactly what you uh, uh, provided. And we'll see this again here in the upcoming slides. There's some additional features about that. The book does a really good job talking about adding the parentheses around it. Let me do that real quick so everyone can see what I'm referring to. So I already messed up and created another variable name. Let's uh, let's say uh, uh, Don. No, let's do underscore do, and we're going to pass the variable uh, five. And if I surround this in a parentheses, not curly brackets, there we go, and execute this line of text, it's not only going to assign or create the name uh, uh, object John Doe, but also pass the value of five and then print it back out to the screen again. Uh, so this uh, adding the parentheses around the assignment and also uh, the uh, execution will output that value as confirmation. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, John Doe is an object, yes. Uh, naming the object John Doe. Uh, Okay, going back, let's see. Uh, here's where we're uh, using our own language to interpret the code itself. Uh, so if you're using that uh, assignment uh, point, uh, it's just saying a common pronunciation would be uh, this value gets, excuse me, this object gets this value. Uh, so it would say that tau gets two times pi is how we would interpret that uh, particular line of text, the word gets, where we're, we're assigning it or passing uh, that. I, I just want to say, I find it super helpful as you're learning these things to take the time to learn how to pronounce it out loud because it allows you to like think it when you're reading it. The code becomes less code and more language. And the more, the more it activates the language part of your brain, like the easier it gets. Um, they've done studies when you're writing code, you tend to use the language part of your brain. When you're reading code, a lot of times, especially if you're not familiar, you use like puzzle solving parts of your brain. But if you can move it into the language part of your brain, it's a big part of our brain. Like we've got a whole lot of brain de dedicated to language. And so the more you can think of it, uh, then that, that's like what the entire tidyverse is built around is trying to make the code just readable so that you can read through it and say, oh, now I'm filtering, now I'm selecting, now I'm mutating. And like they try to make words that have meaning. Um, and so uh, it seems like a, a weird point to say, oh, people often pronounce this gets, but it's really helpful to see see that. And don't think arrow, because arrow doesn't make any sentence, sense in that sentence. But if you say tau gets two times pi, like, okay, I, I can just think that now. So. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, 
I, I kind of jumped ahead in my text when I was explaining the uh, underscores and the periods. This uh, particular section 4.2, uh, naming things, uh, John and, and, and Mr. Wickham put some text in here uh, surrounding the uh, better practices of naming conventions. Uh, I don't want to regurgitate or, or uh, uh, bring up uh, past conversation. But, and then the other comment is, it is case sensitive. R is a case sensitive uh, language. So therefore, if you follow that same convention, if it's camel case, snake case, if you're if you're calling a, a, a variable capitalized first and then lowercase, you know, the rest or, or however the convention is, just make sure you stick to that. Uh, there's some examples coming up that uh, will name something and then you try to pull it back up and it doesn't exist there may be a mistake and I'll show you some exercises here in a moment that uh, reflect on that, that uh, point. Okay. Um, okay. Let's continue on. Sorry. What's cash invalidation? <laughs> Sorry. Cash that, invalid that was my coworker referencing something that doesn't really belong here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, there's Never so mind. that there are various variations on this quote that people like to do. There are only two. This I can't remember who said this originally, but cache of invalidation is like um, making sure someone doesn't have something in their memory that you don't realize they have, oh, so that it okay. changes the way that the program works. So cache invalidation and naming things, and then end off by one errors because oh, it's okay. that's the joke that there are only two hard things, then they name three things. Um, Got it. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it is useful to pick a convention and follow it. And like we wrote these notes originally for coworkers. And so we're very opinionated about it. Like no, do it this way. Mm. Don't, don't try to come up with other ways to do it because then it's just readable and everyone can borrow each other's code. I see. But I okay. like, we like it. We, you know, long names, descriptive names, uh, long names don't make that big of a difference in, mm -hmm. you know, in how things run, but they make it much more, interpretable by the human reading the code. So we're big fans of long names. <laughs> Got it. The first thing that came to mind, John, when you mentioned the, the uh, uh, code or the script doing something that wasn't initially implied, the first thing that came to mind was security, uh, uh, like not stack overflow as a, as a subject, but um, like the, the interpreter or the, the computer just going bonkers with something uh, my favorite is a, a, uh, a for loop that has no end. It just runs forever and will take over your computer. Um, so, okay. The next topic we're discussing is called functions and we will uh, more than likely probably rely a lot on this uh, in the next week's chapter, uh, dplyr. Uh, with the uh, uh, functions call, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're passing it a variable to do some subject or do some activity. Uh, please correct me if I use that statement incorrectly. You're passing an object, a named object to do some uh, activity with. Okay. So an example in the text, we have uh, length and then we're passing it the object name letters to uh, call. How many letters are there in the English alphabet? The number is 26. So let's try that real quick and see what that does. So I've got all of these listed here. Uh, no, I don't. So I do, uh, what was the value that we were passing? Length, that's it. Length. And then passing it letters. Okay. We're asking the, the uh, R console I'm calling on the function length to uh, uh, pass the the uh, object letters and then tell me the length of that. Uh, I don't be careful with my words here. Uh, vector array, uh, the uh, tibble. Uh, there's different nomenclature that we have for this subject, so that'll open up another topic. But uh, uh, the sequential number is 26 uh, counted value of 26. So that that object letters has 26 like objects inside of it, 26 smaller objects that are yeah. inside of the letters object. And that's where it gets a little confusing about which of these things is an object. Really like everything's an object, but right. <laughs> the thing on the left is 
the most important object when we're doing assignment. Um, that can be a little bit confusing. I think he has an example right after this that um, length is the number of objects, but when we're talking about letters, you might start thinking it's like how many letters. But if we do um, length of, uh, you know, Sam. Uh, yeah, let's, so let's go ahead and do that quick. as so an example. Length, yeah. And then just pass it an object name. Uh, let's use, I don't know, another name. Another name, yeah. And then, so it's right. that's sorry this broke into another topic of <laughs> of strings versus vectors versus right. uh everything arrays etc um there's ways to split that up but that'll be in yeah. to, uh, next week's discussion yes but just you know there another name has one object inside of it that object happens to have three letters but that object is sam quote sam and all is one thing right right okay um how, uh, how's time going? I'm not looking at the clock. I apologize. Um, we're, we're at time, but I think we, okay. You know, I, I can go ahead and wrap up this bit that we're on at least. You go ahead, sir. If you'd like. Uh, oh, no, no, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I can stay oh. around too. Um, okay. So, if, you know, go ahead and go through this last little bit. Okay. So the, the next was talking about N rows uh, and N rows is going to be uh, the number of rows, the number of, of, of actual rows that we have in our, in our data frame. So if you call on the function N row, pass it the data frame or using ggplot2 diamonds as the data frame, how many rows are in that? So I'm gonna copy that text to make this a little faster and pass that in control B. Okay. And uh, just another quick thing on the uh, pronouncing it out loud, parentheses generally are of, if you can think of them as of, like n row of ggplot2 diamonds. Because um, okay. again, activate that language part of your brain. Good point, sir. Good point. So we're asking the number of rows. We're calling on the calculator of the number of rows in the uh, ggplot2 data frame, diamonds data frame, and we're receiving back the uh, 53,940. Uh, 53, and it, I'm gonna just scroll up briefly uh, where we called on that. And we can see again, it's the same value. Um, this may be helpful for users that are working with ephemeral data. Uh, how do you work within it? Uh, the Tinyverse does a really good job in allowing you to uh, make these different functional calls to uh, uh, kind of visualize exactly the, the media that you're working with. Uh, I work with a, a staff member, team member that is very, very XY coordinate Excel spreadsheets and that's the only thing the person knows. And I have been working with them to try and bring it into a more statistical modeling language where you can't see all of your data, right? These tables may be very large. The data frame may be very large. And so you've got to be able to use different commands to uh, manipulate it, uh, flip it around, you know, do all the, the various calculations to it and, and really become aware of, of what it is that you're working with. So uh, going back to the last couple of slides here, Uh, we have a sequence, uh, sequences is another function that you can call. Uh, we're passing it. I want a sequence between the numbers one and 10. So with the object name and then the variable passing, uh, we say sequence from one to number 10. And so that's going to iterate uh, in increasing form one through 10. If we switch that though, if we, if we make it uh, reversed and we say sequence uh, to the number 10 from the number one. Well, it's going to do the same thing. We're going to get the, the natural uh, incrementing one through 10. Now, if you were to just call it directly sequence and then two numbers, it's going to sequence between those in the natural path in which it's receiving that information. So in this case, it's calling on the function sequence, uh, passing the number 10 first, and then the number one second, it's going to decrease, uh, decrement from 10 to one. So this could be helpful. It could be something to watch for uh, while you're uh, sequencing, or excuse me, not using that word, uh, writing your code uh, to be aware of good naming conventions uh, uh, when you're, you're, you're creating these more complex uh, arguments. Okay. Just a 
just <clears throat> just to clarify something, yes. when you pass pra uh, pr parameter in R, is it called parameters? It is in pr other programming. Uh, parameters <laughs> or arguments. Oh, okay, yeah. Yep. Parameters or arguments to a function when you, the reason why the first and second give you the same result is because you put the name. That's correct. Yep. Yep. You put two, so it's the same. The reason why the mm -hmm. third is different from the second is because you didn't put the, the name. That, so by default, the, the function has, a, has a, a specific order it's expecting the parameters so uh, when he so i think it's from first right yeah uh, yes naturally it's from first yeah so when <laughs> he didn't name. put in the third example he didn't put from or two it assumed 10 was the from and two Correct. was one, which is why you get a diver different result from the second to the third. Can, can you scroll yes. down? Yep, I sure can. Yeah, so that's why even though in the second you go 10 and one, you still get one through 10, but if you pass it out without the names, it goes 10 to one. And, and yes. yeah, and if we were to if we were to change that from the number one and then 10 being the second, uh, point that we're making, it would be that same sequential. Yeah, that, that's a really good uh, observation with flip-flopping those. Good comment. So you'll see it either way. Sometimes people put, do put the name of what that um, per, uh, parameter or argument is called. Parameter is the, or argument is the, is the thing you pass into the functions. So yeah. you, you can pass things into a function without giving it a name, it will work. But mm -hmm. giving it a name means you could put them in any order you want. And a lot of times, again, um, for making code more shareable, more understandable by future me or by somebody else, a lot of times we will explicitly put all the arguments in. So you don't have to check, oh, wait, is it from first or to first? When you're reading the code, you can know for sure what it means. Um, and it's like there are there's different philosophies of some people want to like be able to type things as fast as possible. And so they'll, you know, they will lean towards the use the unnamed arguments. Um, and, you know, there are there are various reasons for that. But I am a big fan of make it as readable as it can be by, you know, you say by or a lot of times you think about by someone else. But usually that someone else is you in three months. And you don't know what you meant. And so make it easier for you in three months by doing everything yeah. you can to make to be explicit. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'll add one more statement to that. So in uh, Becky, if, if you're still with us, uh, <laughs> last week you had made a statement about the dependent variable versus independent variable. I, I can't tell you how often uh, in, in, in just conventional forms of uh, writing code uh, that comment comes back over and over again. Uh, it's not just in R, it's in other statistical languages, it's on Julia, MATLAB, or Matt, uh, MATLAB. Uh, your values of, of what you're passing is important to the function that you're you're interpreting that uh, those, those uh, values with. Uh, the calling on is, is how you're actually populating these, uh, if you're shorthanding it, uh, what you're putting in, how that function operates, uh, you may have to go into the help menu and expand on that uh, subject. Uh, the last statement team for the, the close of, of this section, uh, we uh, John had put some additional features on here, one of which I wasn't aware of, and I completely blew my mind when I tried it and it worked, was uh, the uh, Alt-Shift-K. Um, you get lots and lots and lots of shortcuts uh, with this feature. So I'm going to do that real quick for both the YouTube video, um, if this doesn't get cut off. But uh, it was Alt Option, Alt Alt Shift, Alt Shift K, right? Alt Shift K. So Alt Shift K. And what you have, at least on the menu, hopefully this comes through without making somebody's uh, mind boggle. Uh, these are all shortcut menus to the RStudio console. 
And so that one uh, can really help you if you're wanting to uh, learn the, uh, the awesomeness of, of using shortcuts. The other point I was going to show, and John, I wanted to ask you specifically, uh, I wasn't sure if I was interpreting this pr correctly, uh, but it, the statement is one of my favorites is uh, alt command down arrow. Uh, does that, is it copy and paste? Is that what that does? Uh, yeah, basically it takes the line you're on and duplicates it to below your cursor. Good. So um, I, I, yeah. I was glad that I wasn't uh, uh, messing that up. So um, the, uh, sorry, double check, alt command down arrow. So alt command, alt command down arrow. Uh, it just repeats it over and over again. Uh, so I, I'm going to take your word for it that this is this is great. I, I haven't uh, tried it yet. Yeah, this was. I can't remember what Jonathan was working on when he put these notes together. But um, okay. if you, you all, one thing that if you're like um, editing code, sometimes it's nice to like see what you did before, but then you want to make some changes to how it works now. And so he would just copy it down, make the changes, and then delete the one above it. Um, there will be times I, I, I can't, I mean, there are other times when it comes up. Um, yeah. my, my personal recent favorite is, um, start to type something in the, uh, console and then control up will find the thing that start, like type NR and then control up and it'll control up. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, or actually it's, it'll be more impressive with like, uh, L E and then control okay. up. L E control up. Yes. Right. No, nope, that didn't. That oh, didn't am do I it. doing? Let's see. Uh, I think it's. No, oh, no, it, it, hmm. it is on mine. Maybe that's different on. Uh, it is. No, Mac. I'm, I'm, I'm actually using a Mac keyboard. Or, so uh, I'm trying to figure out the, there, uh, yeah. the correct, the correct yeah. uh, convention. So command up, I guess. Um, okay. But yeah, it finds anything that starts with those letters in your history. And then you can just arrow through and find the thing. So if you're like, oh, I know that I did this whole long thing before and I don't want to retype all of that. And it started with GS. Okay, GS up. Let's find all that thing that I typed and it'll ah. it'll get it all. Um, you know, not good to like rely on as a reproducible reproducibility kind of thing. But when you're just trying right. to like check something, um, a lot of times while I'm doing something, I'll run the same check multiple times in the console to check that things are doing what I think they're doing. And so going back to that one that I typed and it might be some really long, you know, like I want to go through a data frame and filter to a certain row and check some certain value as I'm making updates. Um, and so I can just run that one again by doing the, you know, DP control up or whatever, depending on what I've, what it starts with. Um, and obviously it's however many letters you type. So if you, you know, if it's, something that you uh that's very specific and you know you type most of it and then control up it'll still find that one whatever matches what is so on your line so far if there is anything um yeah <laughs> so out of out of the entire chapter uh i found the last two or three uh points to be the most mind-blowing and and i do want to appreciate um i believe it's is it yin or or way in uh the 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 comment on the uh, the uh, object versus value versus variable. Um, I, I do want to express a sincere gratitude to uh, uh, the comment. It, it was great feedback and I will do my best to uh, start using that term properly uh, in the uh, upcoming book club uh, examples or presentations. So. It wasn't just you, Ryan. I, I had it all mixed up too. So I think yeah. that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. I, I very much appreciate it. That was awesome. Yeah, I'm going to definitely try to catch myself because I know I will say yeah. variable to mean object, but I, I like having a distinction. I like having them as different words in my head. I think that's that's useful. So, Great. Um, I don't have anything right. more, John. I'm going to pass everything back. I'm going to stop All sharing. Right. Um, I need to, to run, but uh, let's talk in the channel. Um, if someone can present next week, again, it is a great way to learn this stuff. So I highly recommend it. We'll be talking about data transformation. Um, there are not yet existing slides. Um, 
so that we are beyond what we did in my little group at work. Um, there are learning objectives, but not slides. So um, I can help you, you know, put together slides. You can use whatever you want for slides. I don't really care. And then I will move them into this book that we're making. Um, so yeah, let me know if, if you're interested in giving that a try. It's a good chapter. It, this is like an immediately useful chapter. Everything in it, you will use all the time. Um, I'm interested. All I'm right. Excited. All right. I will. I'm going to message you on Slack so I remember that it was you who said it, and then we can talk more about it um, shortly. Uh, just a just, quick thing about shortcuts. Yeah. You can actually reassign the shortcuts because some of the commands, as you see, are really long. Like you have to press four different keys, and that's not good for Carpal Tunnel. Right. So if there's something you use often. And you're like, OK, I don't not like pressing four different keys to do that. You can actually uh, change the shortcut. Um, I don't see you on Slack. Is Are you under a different name on Slack way in? Um, in any case, just message me, John, or John the Geek over on Slack, and we will get okay. you sorted out. Yep. Um, all right, I'll see everybody next week. Thank you very much. This was a great conversation. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.